of you for being and joining us tonight and feeling the presence of God. There's nothing like being together and, and being in the presence of the Lord. And, and for those who have joined us online at Bethany, I thank you for joining us. And tonight, again, I want to share what the Lord has put in my heart. But before I do, let's pray. The Lord, I thank you for another opportunity I have to share your gospel. And I just pray, Lord, that it will minister to our hearts. It will encourage us, Lord. And and that knowing that you walk with us, Lord, and that you guide and you direct and you give direction. So I just thank you for that, Lord. And I ask that you would open our ears to receive and our hearts to receive, Lord, with what you would have for us. And all that will be accomplished will be sure to give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to start out by making a statement. The choices you make when you get God's direction will become the hinges on which your destiny swings. Let me say that again. The choices you make when you get God's direction will become the hinges on which your destiny swings. So I thought about that and I thought, will we obey or will we disobey when we get direction from the Lord? And the Lord gave me this message last night when I was uh, in my bedroom. And I, want, I was so excited, and I was telling my mom and dad, I said, I'm so excited because it, it confirms what the Lord gave us this morning on direction because he has given the church, he's going to give the church some direction. And it will be up to us whether we go in that direction and, and where our destiny swings with that. And so tonight I wanted to talk on, and I thought about, okay, who did the Lord give direction for that they obeyed and they disobeyed? And he gave me the children of Israel. So we're going to take a look at Exodus chapter 3. And we're going to look at verses 1 through 10. And I've got several scriptures because I want to bring home the point of when we disobey and when we obey and what that does for us. So Exodus chapter 3 verses 1 through 10 is the beginning. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him and flamed a fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. First off, I want to mention here, God's initial revelation to Moses was of his holiness. Take off your sandals, you are on holy ground. He revealed himself to Moses. And what is holiness? So I looked it up. Holiness means separation from sin and evil, and commitment to righteousness. Moses, as God's servant, had to remember continually that God whom he served was holy. And we are no different. The God who we serve is holy. And he expects, and he even said this morning, I am a holy God. He is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is still holy, and he expects, and, and I am sure, without a shadow of a doubt, because he is holy, he'll begin to work in areas of our lives that is not, so that we become more committed to righteousness, and the sin and evil is not within us. Um, then he says to Moses that he was going to bring the children of Israel out of the, the land of Egypt 
to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So God let Moses know he was going to do this and use Moses. And as you follow their journey, and through the scriptures, as you follow their journey, you see miracle after miracle. You see God's provision for them, how he's provided for them. You see him part the Red Seas. He does all kinds of things um, for the children of Israel because he is going to take them to the promised land. He has taken care of them so that they are at the point, they are at the point of the promised land. So we're going to jump into Numbers because this is where they are now. Numbers chapter 13, and I want to look at verses 1 through 3. It said, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. For each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran, and all of them were the, the leaders of the Israelites. Send some men out to explore the land of Canaan. And I want you to get this, which I am giving them. The Lord had already said he was giving it to them. God had already promised them this land. He promised it back with Moses. And now we have Joshua. Forty years have gone by, or not yet, but it's going to, and I'll tell you why. But he, has, he promised Moses this. At this point, he's promised Moses, I have given him this land. But let's pick it up at uh, Numbers 13. Uh, 23 to 33 says, When they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and figs. Uh, that place was called the valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land, and they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amal I can never say these names. Amalekites live in Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. We seemed like grasshoppers. They took what they felt. They forgot who God was and what he'd already done for them. If we look at um, verse 29 again, it says the Amalekites live in Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. If we take a look again at Exodus 3.8, it says, which is at the beginning, it says, so I have got, come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, to bring them out of the land into a good and spacious land, a flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. You see where these scriptures all line up? God had already said, these people live there, but I am giving you the land. So instead of saying, hey, God has already promised us this, they saw themselves as grasshoppers in their sight, and they gave a bad report. And so, therefore, God had already gone before them in that land. The, they, the people lived there that they said, he said would live there. But what I see here is unbelief in those who went to spy out the land. There was unbelief. Number one, God's past faithfulness to his people did not bring these men into a loyal relationship with him. Of all the things that God did, their relationship with God was not loyal. And the second thing I see is they did not trust God and his promises concerning their future. They did not trust God. Do we trust God? 
concerning our future, when all the things that we have seen God do in our life, do we trust him with our future? After all that God did for them and providing for them, performing miracles, they failed to remember God's past faithfulness, to trust him as their Lord and accept him at his word. They failed to do that. They were right at the door of the promised land. They were right there. But the choice that they made became the hinges of their destiny where it swung. The choice that they made. They chose not to believe God, not to go in the direction that he had said. And it was their, that swung their destiny. What was their destiny? Instead of the promised land, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. That became their destiny. Instead of entering into the promised land. If we look at um, Numbers chapter 14, verses 22 and 23, it says, God speaking here says, Not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who did disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised an oath to their ancestors. No one has treated me with contempt will ever see it. That became their destiny. And if we look at verses 28 to 35, it says, So tell them, the Lord's still speaking, As surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who has counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will ever enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, uh, son of Jephna, and Joshua, son of Nun. And as for your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them to enjoy the land you have rejected. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness, until the last of your body lies in the wilderness. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to this whole wicked community, which has banded together against me. They will meet their end in the wilderness. Here they will die. Their disobedience brought upon them God's wrath, death, and destruction. Failure to enter the promised land. But their children would. Their children would. God said to Moses, he had given them the land. He had given the children of Israel the land. If they would have obeyed, all they would have had to do was do their part, and God would have fought for them. He, they just needed to do their part. So they cho the choice they made became the hinges on which their destiny swung, dying in the wilderness. But now I want you to take a look at what happened to their children after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. So we're going to look at Joshua. We're going to look at verses, chapter 5, verses 13 through 6 through 2. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went, went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went in and no one came, no one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with the king and its fighting men. I want you to see once again, the commander of the Lord um, tells Joshua to take his sandals off because he is standing on holy ground. And again, the Lord said, he is holy this morning. Again, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can, he, he looks to us and he says, I am a holy God. Therefore, sin and evil shouldn't be in our life. And we should be committed to righteousness. 
Does that say we're perfect? Does that say what that we are perfect? No, we're not perfect. But when we make a mistake or when this sin comes in, what should we do? Ask God to forgive us so that we might continue to walk in his righteousness, that we might continue to be. He says, be holy as I am holy. That's what he says. So that's what he's looking for in our lives. He knows we're going to make mistakes, but he's wanting us to remember who he is and that our lives will, will stand up to what he's wanting from us. The same God that told Moses at the very beginning is the same God that's telling Joshua. And it's the same God that's telling us that he's a holy God. I find that, that super interesting. And the Lord tells Joshua he has delivered Jericho into your hands. Then he gives him the battle plans. Take a look at Numbers chapter 6, and we're going to look at verses 3 through 5. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the ar army will go up, everyone straight in. Let me tell you a little bit about the city of Jericho. It covered about eight acres. The walls may have been as, as much as 30 feet high and 20 feet thick. Jericho was considered to be invincible, protected by the gods of the Canaanites. The capture of Jericho was the key to Joshua's whole war strategy, for it would demonstrate that Israel's God was superior to the Canaanites' gods, that this defeat of the Canaanites was certain because there's only one true God. There's only one true God. So they served God of stone and wood, and that's what, they, what Jericho was under. But God was going to show them who was God. The pl battle plan to take the promised land was simple, and it was strange. Simple and strange. But you have to remember that God's ways and thoughts are not our ways and thoughts. That God's ways sometimes don't make sense to us in our mind. But nevertheless, we are to follow his direction. And I, I'm sort of excited because when the Lord said he's going to direct the church this morning, I got super excited. I really did because I already knew what my message was about. And I know that if we follow his direction, there's victory. There's victory if we follow his direction. But sometimes you have to be willing to look a little strange and be radical to live an extraordinary life. Sometimes we have to look a little strange to do that. But be, as long as we're following God, it's okay, because he will work it all out. Notice God said, see, I have delivered them into your hands. God did not say, I will deliver them into your hands. He had already taken care of it by, the, by, by them obeying him. They would see the victory and they would see the miracle that God did with bringing down the wall. So let's take a look at Numbers 6, verse 20. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed, so everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. Their choices that they made became the hinges on which their destiny swung. They had victory. They obeyed, and they had victory. Jericho was tightly shut up, and I would say sometimes it can feel that our promises that we have been given are tightly shut up, that sometimes we don't see them come about right away, that God has promised us something, but we don't see it. So does that mean that we give up because we don't see it? No. We keep moving forward. Just as the children of Israel continued to march, they didn't see their victory at first, but they kept marching. The Israelites walked around Jericho for six days, and as far as they could tell, nothing was happening, as far as they could tell. And I'm sure that the people 
inside the wall or behind the wall were very nervous. I'm sure they were because they had heard all about the children of Israel's God who was with them. They had heard all about him. So I'm sure that they were super nervous. But those that were walking around the city could not tell that one brick had fallen yet. So I would ask you, what do you do when, God's, what, when what God says doesn't match up to what you see? When all you see is a big wall uh, standing between you and your promise and your situation. There will be times when we, we have done everything that we know to do and you still don't see any progress. Don't give up. Don't give up. God would say, keep walking. He would say, by faith, keep walking. Just because you don't see God at work does not mean that he is not at work. In John chapter 5, verse 17, it says, In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I am working too. My father is always at his work. He is always working. So when the enemy comes at you and gives you all the reasons um, to give up, I would say to you, you might be on lap seven. As the children were on lap, the children of Israel were on lap seven, and they didn't know it yet. And you might not know it, but just around the corner might be your victory. So don't give up. Don't quit. Because there's victory when we obey what God is asking us to do. What if those walking around Jericho had stopped at day six because they didn't see anything? They would have not seen the victory that they saw. So I would say to you, they would have missed out on what God had planned to do. And I will tell you, each individual decision you make to obey or ignore God's promptings and directions in your life is a thread that weaves the tapestry of your life, each decision that you make. And it's important to make wise choices that reflect the heart of God. So when he says, I am holy, our choices should be choices that reflect the heart of God. That's what it should do. And remember, the choices you make when you get God's direction and promptings will become the hinges on which your destiny swings. And I would ask you to remember Naaman, who had leprosy, and he was told to dip in the water seven times. What ha would happen if he would have stopped at six because he saw no change? He would have walked away still a leper because the directions were dip seven times. Let us not fall short on what God is asking us to do in the directions. So I would say um, when he gives us directions and he's going to give us directions. I totally believe that for this church. And when he gives us directions, let's obey it to the T because he's going to bring revival. But he's looking at our hearts. He says, because I am holy. He's going to be looking at our hearts and he's going to be saying, okay, this needs to come out. This area in your life needs to come out because we need you to reflect the heart of God who is holy. And so he'll begin to deal with this. I, I picked that up when he said, I am holy. Because he's wanting us to get to that point where we can say, I am holy because he is holy because he continues to work in my life. He continues to draw me so that I might have a heart like his. And I would say to you, I don't know what, what lap you're on, whether you're on the first lap, the sixth, or the seventh, but keep walking by faith because God is at work. And you don't want to miss out on what he has. Keep walking. Keep the faith. And I remember um, one night in the middle of the night, Dave was not there, and I was having all my cancer stuff. And the Lord woke me up in the middle of the night, and he said, By my spirit, says the Lord, this mountain shall be removed. And I was like, yes, yes. But you see, God's ways are not our ways. So I'm thinking I'm not going to have any more surgeries. I'm, he's just going to heal me. But that was not God's way. 
he had still stuff for me to do in that journey. And so when we hear a word from God, don't just assume to do it this way. Wait on him for direction because he'll give it to us and his ways are always the best. Let's pray. So Lord, I thank you for this opportunity I've had to share your word. And I pray, Lord, that those that are here tonight and those listening online, you know exactly where they are. You know the things they're going through, and maybe they feel like they have not seen what you have promised. But I pray that this message will encourage them not to give up, because the victory is just around the corner as they keep pressing on. So I thank you, Lord, for all that's going to be accomplished as they go forward in you, believing the promises that you've given them. And I am looking, so looking forward to what you're going to do at Bethany Assembly, Lord, believing that you're going to give us direction and we're going to see the revival that you have promised. So I thank you for all things, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.